Tonight on Wings, take off with the Discovery Channel and Soviet air power. New data on Soviet aircraft technology has had a sobering effect on many military leaders. Once thought to deploy only sheer quantity, the new Soviet air power consists of highly sophisticated jets rivaling any in the West. The Soviets' latest aircraft, the MiG-27 Flogger and the MiG-29 Fulcrum, employ advanced avionics and missile technology. These jets are a match for anything the West has in the air. Tonight, soar high with Soviet air power on wings. Recent events in the Soviet Union point to a dramatic decay in that nation's might, influence, and unity. But in spite of all this political turmoil, the USSR's formidable arsenal of air power remains the world's only credible threat to American dominance of the skies. Just as there are many Soviet republics, so too are there many Soviet air forces. They include autonomous air armies, the frontal or tactical aviation group, and military transport aviation. Showing no signs of the fractures affecting the USSR, they remain unified as the Soviet Air Forces, or VVS. Right from its birth, Russia, and later the Soviet Union, has felt itself surrounded by enemies. From the Mongol tribes of Genghis Khan, to Napoleon, to Hitler, time and again, invading armies have ravaged the land. Even during the Russian Civil War of 1918, Western troops fought alongside white Russian armies in an attempt to defeat the Bolsheviks. Indeed, Lenin proclaimed that the capitalist nations would forever try to destroy this pioneer communist state. This age-old suspicion of the outside world has always prompted the state to maintain huge armed forces. By the 1930s, the Soviet Union was eager to display the achievements of its nationwide centralized planning. Embodying this desire was the Antonov-20 Maxim Gorky, largest aircraft in the world. The flagship of a propaganda squadron, it often flew escorted by fighters to accentuate its huge size. The rise of Nazi Germany in the 1930s threatened the fledgling Soviet state. But the Red Army, weakened by terrible internal divisions, and with many of its key officers killed in Stalin's purges, was not ready to repel an invasion. On June 22, 1941, Hitler unleashed five million troops against the USSR. The resulting conflict saw an estimated 30 million Soviets lose their lives. This war against Germany was known by the Soviets as the Great Patriotic War. The Luftwaffe was ordered to destroy the cities. To defend their motherland, thousands of young men and women from all over the Soviet Union joined the Air Defense Group, which included barrage balloons, anti-aircraft guns, and fighters. The battle for control of the air over the cities was long, bloody, and hard. The most numerous fighters were the Yaks, of which over 37,000 were built, more than any other type of fighter in history. This despite the fact that in the fall of 1941, to avoid being bombed, production facilities had to be moved far to the east, often to places where there were no railways and only dirt roads. But there was never a shortage either of fighters or of pilots. No fewer than 93 members of the air defense group were recognized as heroes of the Soviet Union, an honor never bestowed lightly. These BF 110s, 109s, and FW 190s were among the more than 7,300 fascist aircraft confirmed as destroyed by the air defense group whose equipment was swelled by large numbers of American air cobras and British hurricanes. The tide began to turn in favor of the Soviet Union. A lasting bond of friendship was formed with France, whose pilots formed a special unit, the Normandie Neiman Regiment. With 237 confirmed victories, it was by far the top scoring French unit of World War II.
Now, many thousands of families in the Soviet Union have seen fathers, sons, and even grandsons serve in the defense of the motherland. In the Great Patriotic War, David Kachuk flew no fewer than 820 combat missions, mostly in SB-2 bombers. Not many details have filtered through to the outside world about the massive Soviet bomber campaign, which put down more bomb tonnage on the fascist heartlands than the combined weight of the RAF and U.S. Army Air Force. David had two sons, both of whom serve today. No Air Force in the world has a greater sense of history than that of the VVS, the Central Air Forces of the Soviet Union. Virtually every cadet visits the Air Force's museum at Monino to see the actual Lovachkins, Yaks, and MiGs that drove off the invaders. After graduating from high school, thousands of cadets each year start on the long road that leads to being a Soviet combat pilot. Right at the start, remotely piloted model airplanes are used to instill a feeling of air combat and a sense of how to achieve a dominant tactical position. These youngsters plan to go on to a military air school where they'll be instructed and monitored by political officers. In past times, great emphasis was placed on ideological purity, patriotism, and political dogma. Also important is the use of gliders. Here at the Vanitsa Aero Club in the Ukraine, Czech-built Blanik tandem seat training gliders are used as the first step in basic flight training. This young man is the third generation of his family to devote his life to the VVS. Most pilots train on gliders at their nearest aero club. Many then go on to a very demanding aerobatic training on such agile aircraft as the Su-26 or Yak-55 and the Yak-53, here practicing in formation. Probably the best aerobatic trainers in the world. With such practical flight training behind them, the cadets feel ready to face the tough course at an Air Force flight academy. Here, they are cut down to size and reminded that every mission starts from the ground and must be properly planned. Traditionally, their political training is also intensified. Before any pilot gets into the cockpit, he must perfect his skills in repeated sessions on electronic simulators. After weeks of training, at last comes the thrill of the first flight. The standard jet trainers are built in Czechoslovakia, the L-29 Delphin, seen here, and the L-39 Albatross. Both are tough all-metal aircraft, much more advanced than anything the cadet has seen before. On his first flight, he's really little more than a passenger, but over the coming months, he becomes not just an able pilot, but totally at home under the most demanding circumstances. At last comes graduation, when the most able cadets pass out as fully qualified Soviet pilots, ready for posting to a combat training unit. First comes a combat training regiment, the kind known in the West as a combat crew training wing or operation conversion unit. Here the eager fledglings are introduced to MiG-21s. This tailed Delta Wing fighter serves with more air forces than any other aircraft. Those used for training are unpainted, but in every other respect, they are characteristic of those serving in combat units. After honing their flying skills and familiarizing themselves with the partial pressure flying suit and helmet, the course continues. Each pilot is already accomplished in formation flying, but now he has to deal with